If you're a physicist, you want a particle collider. If you're an astronomer, you'd probably like very large telescopes. And if you're a marine scientist in Australia, you need at least one of these, an ocean-going research ship. When you interview astronomers, you don't ask them why they need telescopes. Um, and you shouldn't ask us why we need research vessels. They're, this is our dish, you know, it's, it's that sort of important to us as a community. Without a dedicated research platform, a, for a country with one of the largest oceanic area to land in the world, we'd be hobbled in terms of understanding what those resources are. Blind. Blind. I'd like you to meet the Southern Surveyor. It's Australia's only blue water marine research vessel. Now, since 1990, it's done around about 200 voyages and it's just about to depart on its very last voyage to the Southern Ocean. Many tons of food, fuel, equipment, supplies and anchors are all on board. The last to load is a floating weather station. It's called a Southern Ocean Flux Mooring because that's where it's going to be anchored. Rain gauge. In fact, it's the largest ever put out in the Southern Ocean. And it measures the exchange of heat and salt and carbon dioxide between the air and the ocean. How long have you been using these for? This is the fourth one. <laughs> so about four years now. We, we turn them around every year. Anchoring it securely in high seas several kilometres deep is one thing. Recovering it safely a year later is another. Because with the big waves, this thing is moving from as high as the top of the bridge down to below the, the paint line on the ship, up and down with the waves. We're trying to get a hold of it. it hasn't always worked perfectly, <laughs> but we hope it will this time. Built tough enough to withstand the roughest seas on the planet, the mooring is still treated with all the reverence that a million dollar price tag commands. Tom's a biogeochemist, and for him, this mooring is crucial to monitoring the global carbon cycle. The part we go to is a bit where the ocean mixes from the surface all the way down to 600 metres depth. His cutting-edge technology is the only way to measure how this deep mixing moves heat and CO2 from the atmosphere into the ocean. Meanwhile, below decks, the chief engineer and his team are warming up technology that's not quite as new. The ship is 40 years of age, and uh, a lot of times when the ship gets to about 15, 20 years of age, they're considered to be quite an old ship, so 40 is a real old age pension. <laughs> Fred says everything still works fairly well, but it does take a certain inventiveness, like the time the surveyor lost its steering gear. Went on the internet looking to see if they could locate a, an original pump. And the last one had been sold to a science museum in the UK. <laughs> so what did you do? Uh, well, we got modern pumps and redesigned the system. Today, everything's ship shape and it's all systems go. While the process of going to sea hasn't changed much over the last 20 years or so, its scientific purpose certainly has. Turn the thrust forward. The surveyor started life in the 1970s as a factory trawler catching cod off Iceland and Greenland. In 1988, it was purchased by the Australian government. It'll cost almost $4 million to refit her for a new role, monitoring existing fisheries and looking for new ones. Several years later, it was recommissioned as a scientific vessel. Federal Prime Industry Minister John Kerrin was called in to do the honours. The Southern Surveyor. Southern Surveyor. From the Tasman Sea to the Gulf of Carpentaria, the surveyor assessed fisheries and tested gear. At the time, oceanographic research was done by a smaller second research ship, the Franklin. And that was how it was done back in those days, um, you know, separate kind of science, separate platforms. We found in the 1990s that just wasn't sustainable and so we had to make the decision to consolidate our science onto a single platform. For more than 20 years, the Southern Surveyor has been the marine research vessel looking at what's on the seabed, to what lives in the water above it, to how the whole lot interacts with the atmosphere. Over that time, it's covered more than an eighth of the planet's surface. It's crisscrossed our region, from Macquarie Island to the Philippines, from the Indian to the Pacific Oceans. The ship evolved from a fish catcher to an explorer of biodiversity. 
It tows deep sea cameras to reveal glimpses of unknown and inaccessible habitats. It releases new probes and underwater gliders that trace currents and chemistry. It skims nets along the surface to collect marine debris and follow the fate of our waste. Every time it goes to sea, it's taking a massive range of observations, physical information, chemical information and biological information. So it's a massive floating laboratory out there taking terabytes of data every time it, it goes to work. And on this voyage, as always, everything is subject to the whims of weather and waves. So we assume it's still there. Yeah. It may not be. <laughs> The purple patch on the wave forecast map means a swell of 15 metres, right where they're headed. For this voyage to be a success, we need to deploy all our moorings and recover all our other moorings that are already out there. As carbon dioxide levels climb, the big question is how much the ocean can absorb. Answering that question depends on getting the flux mooring in place, and that depends on the weather calming down enough to release it safely. Climate scientist Bernadette Sloyan has lived on the ship for many voyages, tracking the currents of the southern, Indian and Pacific oceans. It's noisy, to be honest. It's, a, it's an old vessel and so the noise is a big impact. Um, it can be cramped at times. I suppose the thing that makes the vessel is the people and that makes a voyage very enjoyable. Ironically, for a noisy trawler, the surveyor has a talent for mapping the world with sound. The ship uses sonar beams to detect fish schools. Yeah, I reckon it started aft. But to calibrate the system, you need to hang a ball bearing under the ship, and that can be tricky. We have an acoustic beam, if you like, a torchlight going down into the water, and we have to move that ball around in the torchlight, the beam of the acoustics, to map out that beam. My guess is you don't come across the port a little. With what's called a swath mapper, they're able to paint a 3D picture of the seabed, even to a depth of 5,000 metres. We're sending a sonar beam down to the seafloor. It's bouncing back, and the time it takes tells us how far away the seafloor is. What we have is a big fan-shaped array of these beams, which go out across a strip of the seafloor. And as the ship moves forward, we're taking a series of pings of information going forward, which gives us a great big detailed strip of what the seafloor looks like. So is this showing there's a, a mountain range off the east coast of Australia, underwater, that we never see? That's exactly the case. What we have is some quite large volcanic seamounts. These can be 1,500 metres high in places. Known as the Tasmantan seamounts, they were mapped in detail for the first time only last year. Related to the development of the Great Dividing Range, they hold 40 million years of Australia's tectonic and climatic history. It's less than 10 years that we've actually been able to acquire this type of data. And around the world, it's transformed the way people do science. The seabed under Australia's ocean territory covers 85 million square kilometres. After all these mapping voyages, it seems the surveyor has barely scratched the surface. That leaves us with about 60 million square kilometres still to go. So we've still got quite a bit of work to actually understand a lot of what's going on with the seafloor around Australia. But this is a converted trawler, not a luxury liner. It rolls like a pig, rolls terribly, um, but pitching it's, it's pretty good. So if you've got a big swell on the beam, yes, it rolls badly. Um, roll you out of your bunk at times. Electronics engineer Lindsay MacDonald has been working on the surveyor for 21 years. Now, when I first came to sea, it was more sort of burgers and, and um, mixed grills. In fact, that was basically every meal. And the cooks were great big burly guys full of tats. These days, some of them could be working in a nice restaurant. And the food, at times, is fantastic. Everybody puts weight on these voyages. In fact, we had... Um, uh, we're already up here to do the CTD, so um, we, we, I think we need some sorrow people. Got to be you. Yeah, that's me. Uh, yeah. That's me. I've got to have to go. Lindsay's job on this voyage is to operate the CTD, short for Conductivity, Temperature and Depth. This instrument is the standard workhorse of oceanographic research. It's rigged to take water samples at specific depths. This will operate down to 6,000 metres. Usually we have that amount of wire on. Even though the surface water can be 30 degrees, you're pulling up water from down below. It's like a one degree temperature. Because it's the cold water that flows around the world. It currents from the Antarctic. 
Decades of CTD sampling have built a valuable data set on the drivers of the world's currents and whether they may be shifting. On an intensive void, we might do up to 90 or 100 or something like that. Um, and when they go down to 6,000 6, metres, you know, it takes hours at a time to do a CTD. But you never get bored with it? Um, well, <laughs> no, it's always interesting, yeah. In recent years, scientists have established four deep ocean mooring sites. One in the Timor Passage, another in the East Australian Current, one on the ice edge of Antarctica, and this one south of Tasmania. From here, they've been collecting a time series of data since 1998. They've arrived at the right spot in the sub-Antarctic zone, and luckily, the weather has calmed enough to release the moorings. Something that there's plenty of on this ship are ropes and cables, thousands of metres of them. That's because they've got to drop this very expensive equipment and anchor it in water that's four and a half kilometres deep. The aim of this entire voyage is to get the moorings safely off the ship with every instrument intact and working. Please, this year mooring go in, Dr. Schultz. To left. With the flux mooring attached to 6,000 metres of cable, it's anchored with four tons of railway wheels. Mission accomplished. Having a ship like Southern Survey is very important for the science I do because we want to collect observations over long periods of time in situ, so on site, and we can't have a ship stationed um, year in, year out in remote locations like the Southern Ocean. We've shown that the ocean is playing a much more important role in climate and we're understanding that because of the research we do. Pioneered on the surveyor, this work will continue for years, but the ship won't be coming back. We need to recognise that Southern Surveyor is now you know, approaching 42 years old and that the costs of maintaining a vessel like that keep increasing every year. A custom-built $120 million replacement is rising from a Singapore shipyard. The RV Investigator will be a third larger than the Surveyor, able to stay at sea with double the passengers for twice as long. When Investigator arrives in Hobart later this year, we'll be putting Sun Surveyor on the international market for sale. The plan for the new ship is to be at sea for 300 days a year. We have very high demand for Investigator. In 14-15 we had over 800 days applied for. Uh, which is clearly many more days than we can do in 12 months. So demand is very healthy. But the funding is yet to catch up. The commissioning of the vessel is fully funded. And the operation? Well, that's, cur that's currently part of the federal budget process. When we farewell the Southern Surveyor, it will be remembered for its legacy. The expansion of Australian science in one of the largest marine territories on Earth. <laughs>